The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Matthew. Glory to you, Lord Christ. At that time, Jesus declared, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and understanding and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. The gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Go ahead and take a seat. We're focusing on Ephesians chapter 4, and the first thing that I noticed when I was reading this passage was I started to remember what it was like when I was a kid, when I was in elementary school, when I was in middle school, because I had these two forces that were at work in me, and I had no idea at the time, but they seemed completely contradictory when I named them out loud. First, here's what I wanted. I want it to be just like everyone else. Let me make it clear, my name is Percy. If you have not read a book or a magazine in the last thousand years, you will know that Percy is not a common name. Percy is a weird name. Percy is a, a name that's pretty easy to make fun of. There, aren't, there weren't, when I was growing up, a lot of positive people whose name was Percy, okay? I wanted to be like Chris or Brian. Whatever the most Bubba would have been better than Percy, right? Like, it didn't matter. I wanted to be, I wanted to have the same clothes everybody else had. I wanted to do the same things. And you know what? I grew up in an era where we had access to television. And it was showing us, man, the lives that existed outside of ourselves. I tell her, like, television was the social media before social media. I thought that if I could be just like everyone else, I was going to be accepted. I would belong. So that means when I worked super hard and saved up all my money in seventh grade and I went to the store to spend it all, what did I do? I bought a pastel suit so I could look just like the people in Miami Vice thinking, everybody's going to be wearing this this year because everybody's going to accept me. As you can tell by your laughter, the white pastel suit did not go over well, and I did not receive that sense of belonging that I hoped for. So that was the one thing, and I think we all get it. We want to be like everybody else. We don't want to stand out. We want people to just see us and, and, and not make fun of us and not bring attention to us. But then there's the equal and opposite thing. I also wanted to be special. Isn't that true? We want to be just like everybody else, but at the same time, we so deeply long to be special. You say, well, it sounds to me like you were pretty special. <laughs> no, what I was was different. Different has all sorts of connotations. I wanted people to notice my difference and have it say, here's an important person. Here's somebody that matters. Here's the unique contribution that they make. And I walked around with those things all the time, right? And this is what the world was selling me. But you know what? God is kind of tricky. Because in a situation where even the church sometimes was lying to me about who I was. For instance, the church oftentimes will say, be a Christian, and when I mean be a Christian, I mean act like such and such. Be them. I, don't be yourself, be them. Because <laughs> you, uh, you're iffy. That's oftentimes what it was saying. If you want to be, if you want to be, belong, all you got to do is just wear the right clothes, act the same way, do the same stuff as I do, and then you'll belong. Until you stop doing those things, and then we will kick you out. You know, we'll make fun of you. You'll become different again. But what happens in those situations, 
And this is the other end of the quote. What happened oftentimes is people said, well, I'm not going to do that because being a part of a community, all it does is it drains everything that makes me unique, right? So that what you want me to do? Just, just come in here and lose my identity? Have it be swallowed up in this larger identity and I'm not even a person anymore? We stand at both ends of that, don't we? We desperately want to be ourselves, but at the same time, we want to belong. Well, here's the tricky thing that God did. He raised up a kid who absolutely loved certain forms of entertainment. And let me tell you what my favorite forms of entertainment were. Comic books. And you know what my favorite comic books were? The Avengers and the X-Men. I love cartoons. You know what my favorite cartoon was? It was G.I. Joe and Voltron. Some of you guys don't recognize it. My favorite television show, The A-Team. <laughs> and my favorite movie were The Magnificent Seven, The Dirty Dozen, and even today, and my kids make fun of me on this, if there's an Avengers movie on, on television, guess what's on my TV? I have seen these movies thousands of times, but I want you to notice the theme if you're familiar with these. The theme of those stories is they have this deep and abiding unity and community, and they're all radically different. Radically. The thing that makes Magnificent Seven as a movie is you've got these seven gunfighters who are in it together, but there is different as they can be. Each and every one of them is unique, but they are a family. They are a unit. They're everyone different, and that's what makes them great. Their unity doesn't mean the destruction of identity. Their very identity is being formed by the unity and what they bring to the table. You see, this is the false unity. The false unity that the world wants us to say is you want unity, agree on everything. Do all the same things, look the same, be the same. But is that what we hear from Paul or from Jesus? It's actually quite different. Paul says something that should blow our minds. He looks at our contradictory desire to belong and be special, and he looks us in the eyes and he says, you know what? That's exactly what God wants for you too. Desperately. He wants you to belong, to have real unity with other people, and at the same time, he wants you to be more you than you've ever had the capacity to be. How do we see that in this text? Have you looked at it? Belonging. In a world that says belonging is uniformity, what does Paul say unity is built on? And we've been singing about it all day. Paul talks about the Spirit, the Son, and the Father. He says, you know what our unity, our unity is not built on agreement. Our unity is built because we are animated by the same Spirit. One Spirit one body. By the way, that is a rule. If you've got more than one spirit in your body, we have a name for that. It's called possession, demon possession. It's not good. You remember the story about the guy Legion? Wasn't awesome for him. We have a one spirit, one body rule. And so that's true for the church. We have one Holy Spirit, and it's the thing that animates us. You know, my finger is different from my toe, which is different from my nose. But we're in full unity as an organism. And that's because I have one spirit that animates and motivates and moves me to use and utilize these things in that way. And by the way, this finger is different from this finger. Incredibly. And yet, they're not bickering with each other. Mm. Our unity is built on the unity that the Holy Spirit gives the church of Jesus Christ. Now, we don't do a good job of living into that because we forget and we take the substitute of the world, don't we? The unity is built because, well, we all kind of like each other. Is that what it says here? Or is it built on God's Spirit speaking truth and life and animating 
broken things. One spirit. What's the other thing? One Lord, and we know his name, Jesus. The agreement that we have is about who the boss is. Do you understand that? And anybody that disagrees with you on that, and so what does it mean that we agree that there's one Lord? One hope, one truth. If you are banking your future on anything other than Jesus, you're not in the unity. <laughs> because we've got one Lord. And he's the only hope that we possibly have. So if you've got multiple backup hopes, then that's probably what's contributing to you not feeling like you belong. If you've got backup truth, if you find yourself, well, that's not my truth. Who cares about my truth? You shouldn't care about my truth. The only truth you should possibly care about is the Lord's truth. Because that is determinative. Because who's, the, who's in charge? The Lord, Jesus, is in charge. So we have this animated unity that's brought by the Spirit. We have this lordship that we're given by the Son. But this is the part I like, too, and contributes most fully. We've got one Father. Do you know what that means? It means we are relationally. We're, we're connected. We are family. And people don't like it when Jesus says this, but he says it again and again and again. If you are a follower of God, no matter where you are, what you do, but, or what you look like, if you are a follower of Jesus, I have more in common with you than I have with my genetic relatives who do not. Do you really? Jesus says it again and again. Hey, your mom, your mom and brothers are outside. Go check on them. He's like, hey, I'll tell you who my family is. The one who do the will of my father is in heaven. That's who my family is. You want to belong? Well, let me tell you something. The entire Godhead has gone to work so that you can belong. Giving you his spirit. Offering you the truth and the direction that you need, and then standing there at the door of the feast like a father with his arms open, saying, come on in. I put this whole thing on for you. Can you understand that it is the Father's deep and abiding heart? It is God's heart that you would belong. And Paul wants you to hear it, but he doesn't want you to believe the lies of belonging. The lies that say, well, you belong when you look like this. You belong when you do this. These aren't about doing. These are about being. So if you've given yourself fully to the God of the universe and you've invited his spirit and you get up in the morning and you say, Jesus, you're the one that's really in charge of this day. And then if you look up and say, our father who art in heaven, then guess what? You have finally started to belong. And that's a beautiful thing. But then there's this second thing, and you're like, I don't know how in the world he is going to work this whole thing out. How is he going to do that? Because it, it would seem that he's transforming me. He's changing me. I'm going to look different because of his work. But I want to be special. I want to be set apart. Well, here's what the world says. The world says the way that I'm different is I do what I want to do when I want to do it. Isn't it? I'm in charge of my life. I'm the one. Now, you already see that that kind of understanding is already antithetical to this whole lordship piece, right? But that's what the world does. True freedom is being able to do what I want to do when I want to do it in the manner and fashion that I want. Is that really what freedom is? The answer to that, that's just how everybody functions. Somebody told me that. I, I, I went to a concert. You guys, there was this big thing called grunge music, alternative music, okay? Now, let me tell you what was so funny about alternative music is I love the music, but I show up to a concert where everyone's alternative, and you know what's ironic? Everybody's dressed exactly the same. Everybody's wearing ripped jeans with a flannel shirt. They haven't combed their hair in months, which was real easy for me <laughs> to fit right in. But isn't that ironic? They are alternative. We're doing our own thing. We are not like anybody else. And I, I could not find my date because they all look the same. 
That's what we do. We say, you know how I'm different? I, I do what I want to do. By the way, we have a name for that. That's called sin, rebellion. But can I tell you, Paul says, let me tell you a secret. That's not being special. That's being like everybody else. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That's said throughout the entirety of the Bible, again and again and again. If you want to be just like everybody else, all you got to do is do your own thing your own way. Now, you won't be special, but you'll be just like everybody else. And see, that's exactly what he's moving them away from. He's saying, let me tell you something. I'm going to give you grace. And you thought this grace was only to forgive you of sins, but when I give you this incredible grace that only comes from the Godhead, it's going to do something. It's going to make you different and special and yet completely united simultaneously. I'm going to give you the best of both worlds. Matter of fact, since I'm your maker and creator, the more you come into me, your identity will not be destroyed it will be renewed, remade, bolstered. You're finally going to know who you are. You're finally going to understand why the things happen to you that happen to you. You're finally going to have a vision for purpose. And that's what I loved about these movies and these cartoons, isn't it? Each of them had a capacity that the other did not have. Nobody can lift something up like the Hulk. Nobody knew how to plan an attack like Captain America. Nobody was willing to go out and do something crazy like Iron Man, to just cook up something and go try it. All of those things were necessary for them to complete their mission. Guess what? It's no different for us. And this is what he said. He says, if you fall into this category of calling yourself a Christian, well, let me tell you something. You're going to fall into a couple of categories because you are on my team. Who's on the team? All people who call themselves a follower of Jesus Christ are on the team. And you know what you're called? You're called a minister. All of you. Now, if you don't follow Jesus Christ or you don't call him Lord, that's not you. You don't have to worry about it. You don't have the resources to do it. But if you are, you're called a minister. And here's the kind of minister you'll be. You'll be an apostle, a prophet, an evangelist, a shepherd, or a teacher. Have you ever thought about it? You're like, oh, that's somebody else's job, right? Like, that's not me. I'm not, ah, I don't like what you're saying now. I want to be special, but I didn't know I was going to get like a job. This is exactly what Paul says. He says that our God is giving away gifts. And part of that means charismata, which is the Greek word. It literally means grace things. That's the word we translate spiritual gifts. But you know what else he's given away? People. And he says, if you're my people, I'm going to take you, I'm going to break you, I'm going to bless you, I'm going to multiply you, and I'm going to give you back to the body of Christ as something that is useful. So if you are a follower of Jesus Christ, you are a minister of the gospel. I got into an argument about this with Alan, our rector. Because I told him something from the prayer book, and he was just like, that does not sound like Anglicans. I told him this. I was like, Alan, man, you know what drew me to this tradition is people are the ministers. The priesthood of all believers is the most important thing that we have at the center. And I was like, man, you know it's in our catechism, right? And he was like, I can't imagine that they would have written it this way. Because we think about all oh, the bishops and the priests, and, you know, we're really important. Let me read to you from our prayer book. Who are the ministers of the church? The ministers of the church, and I want you to notice whose names first, are laypersons first, then bishops, then priests and deacons. And hear this. What is the ministry of the laity? The ministry of laity and laypersons are us, people who are not ordained, people who wander in and say, I know Jesus. Here's what it says. They are to represent Christ and his church, to bear witness to him wherever they may be, and according to the gifts given to them, to carry on Christ's work of reconciliation in the world, and to take their place in the life, worship, and governance of the church. Dang, guys, you guys' job is worse than mine, and longer than mine in this. 
And, and guess what? Just in case you, you, you might forget or think they were joking, guess what they did? It ends this whole section by saying, what is the duty of all Christians? And you know what? It restates that stuff again. Just in case you forgot, because we were using some newfangled language to talk about bishops and priests and deacons, let me remind you, this is primarily your job. And as I look out on this room, every follower of Jesus Christ is given ministry gifts. You are given unique purpose. The best way I can say that is every person in this room who is a follower of Jesus Christ is a unique articulation of the gospel. You say it in a way that no one, you live it in a way that no one else, you are irreplaceable for the kingdom of God. Do you get that? You know, and the reason I say this, and we don't have time, but I want you to understand, you should know what you're good at. Like, when I'm watching these television shows, if there was one guy who's really good at being a pilot, he better know that, right? If there's somebody who, who's really strong or has a particular, if there's somebody who can really give these things, but here's the deal. Every one of you, no matter which one of these categories you fall into, this is the crazy part, you'll do it differently than another person. I'm a prophet. That's where I fall when I do this. But I do it differently than every other prophet I've ever seen or known. Read the Bible. Have you noticed that they all do it differently? Peter was way different than Paul. Even people who have the same gifts and are built the same way are unique. So do we see today this incredible reality? We belong and we're special. Matter of fact, you are a specialist. You are a part of the special forces that has been set aside for a specific time and a specific place to bring forth his gospel. So my question today is, what do you want? This passage ends by saying, what's the goal? To grow up. My whole job as a pastor is to train you guys to do ministry. That's our job. Because you guys are the ones that do the real ministry. No, I don't get to opt out. I've got to do ministry too. But we're building up because we're growing up. So my question is, are we growing up? Are we still like 11-year-old Percy watching television saying, oh man, I just want to be like everybody else. If I could just be like everybody else. And then when I become disappointed with that, moving right over to the other side, and man, I sure do want to be special. Now they've accepted me a little, and now I'm just like everybody else. I sure do want to be special. Or do we want to live in the unique reality that's given only by the one true God of the universe that can call people who are about as different as people can be into a family, into a unity, and do that without destroying the diversity and the uniqueness that he made us for. I don't know if we talked about this, but Ephesians 2.10, for you are God's workmanship. In Greek, that word is poema, poem. You are God's poem, created in God to do, to sit around and enjoy long sermons. Nope. <laughs> to do good works, which he has prepared in advance for you to do. You got a job. And he designed you for that job, and he empowers you for that job. Because you know what precedes that? For it is by grace you've been saved through faith. Not of yourself, a gift of God. So my question is today, what do you want? Do you want that unity? Do you want to feel special? I hope you want them both simultaneously, because I know there's only one place we can get that from, the God of the universe. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for the work of your Son and sending your Spirit to dwell among us. And we pray that even now you will be cultivating in us a deep desire to be one with each other. That was your prayer, Father. That we would be one with each other, that we would love each other well, but in the same time, that we would fan the flame of the unique ministry and identity that we have been given by you, our Creator God and Father. And so do what only you can do in this place. In Jesus' name, amen. We pray you've been edified by this presentation. 
You have been listening to the teaching ministry of the Abbey at Polly's Island, South Carolina. For more information on the Abbey at Polly's Island Church or for more audio, please visit our website at theabbeypollysisland.com.